So off to the topic of the day. So running for office. Um, the reason why we scheduled this is that I was invited to the Douglas County Democrats last week to come and talk on this topic to their group of people. And uh, it was really fun. Uh, I, you know, they have some challenges down there. It's a predominantly uh, red county. And so it's very difficult for people to make headway there. Uh, but the principles of running for office are, are, are universal. And it's, it's absolutely not true that uh, progressives cannot get elected in red counties. We have elected officials all over the state. Um, they just don't make a big deal about uh, their party affiliation. Um, so uh, I, as you, if you've heard me talk about this before, I got started uh, uh, in 2005 uh, in running elections out here on the coast um, because it didn't seem like the people in office were represent were were reflecting the values of the majority of the electorate, and I and I realized that no one was doing candidate search and that that was something that we should do. Um, uh, in a democracy, it's important to have a choice um, uh, on the can from amongst candidates on the ballot. Um, as we have seen, you know, there are many great representatives in the Oregon legislature. There are others who feel that they have, uh, they own the position and they, they, you know, no elected official should feel entitled to their position. And that's sort of what this whole incumbent protection uh, process does, is that they give them the illusion that they're not answerable to the electorate. When the voters have a choice, then you find out that candidates take positions, um, and they make promises to voters with which then the electorate can hold them accountable to. Um, and it's unhealthy when ballots contain no choices. Uh, unfortunately, if there's no one running against the incumbents or even worst case, there's no one running for positions and you look over your primary ballot and you just have one choice at the most on all the positions, it's like why waste the stamp to return it because you have absolutely no, there is nothing that you can change uh, on the course of history there. Um, so at the last show, we talked about all of the positions in the Oregon legislature that have no primary challengers. If you are considering running for office, uh, we encourage you to do so. You can do this without spending a fortune. And at the importance of that is that you start the dialogue with the incumbent on what they should be doing in the subsequent two years. So going to the uh, next slide, the goal of the campaign, uh, which is something that uh, that, that it's, it's like the first, first piece of data that you need to calculate is uh, how many votes it takes to win. So in most, most races, it's, it's uh, a majority, which is at least 50% plus one. Uh, there are some races where uh, mo there's multiple candidates and, and so just a plurality will suffice, which means that you could, if you get 43% and that's more votes than all the other people in the race, then uh, you're, you'll be the winner. Uh, but that's the first thing you need to do is calculate how many votes to what you need to win, because that number is what drives uh, all the de decisions you make about your campaign, like how many voters you need to contact, how many pieces of literature you need to uh, print, um, uh, how much time it's going to take to walk the neighborhoods. With that piece of information, um, you can then launch your campaign. So what there's several different types of campaigns. Uh, and so the question is, what type of campaign uh, do you need to run? Uh, for some reason, people keep uh, resorting to what they've we've historically done, which is to do uh, mass mailings of glossies uh, that are printed up and sent out. Um, when I receive them and I'm, you know, I'm in the crowd that, that are that's a political junkie, I throw them away. Um, unless there's something great about them to keep for future reference. Um, these do nothing to persuade me. They are always um, feel good messages. Uh, usually there's too much text on them and I just don't have time to read through a bunch of uh, uh, material. Uh, it's nice that they acknowledge my existence, but I would be much more impressed if someone would come to my door and talk to me. Um, that's the whole basis of the leadership neighborhood leadership program. We have found that the neighborhood leadership program where people go out and talk to their neighbors is 20 times more effective than mailing pieces or anything else that you can do in a campaign. So um, 
spend your campaign energy and money around knocking on doors and hosting events. Um, do not waste money on mailers. Um, do activities that sear your name into the memory of your voters. Um, if voters are faced with a choice on a ballot, they will vote for the name that they recognize. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, people don't do a lot of investigation because before they vote um, because they have other things going on in their lives. And if it's a local race, so they're not familiar with the incumbents, uh, from my analysis of how people vote, uh, being listed first on the ballot gives you a 50% advantage. So uh, it's really in, important for you to get your name out there. And the rule of thumb we use is that you have to hit the voters three to five times, and then they start remembering who you are. Uh, once you've determined the time, uh, how many votes you need, you should then put together a campaign team. Uh, for local elections, you, you might be able to get by with volunteers. Um, the one thing that you do need is a campaign manager um, because cam can candidates tend to avoid doing things that they're not comfortable with. And the value of a campaign manager is that they will have that little chat with the, with the candidate and explain to them that, no, you have to go out and you have to talk to 50 people today. Um, the other key position you have as a treasurer, because we have uh, stringent reporting requirements here in Oregon, uh, you have to have a campaign treasurer in order to have a pack, and you have to have a pack if you're going to spend more than $750. So a treasurer is important if you're going to run a race that's going to go through more than $750. As I was saying earlier, you know, you, you can challenge um, candidates in, in the legislature and spell well, spend well below $750. So it is not essential for you to have a pack um, and a treasurer uh, if you are not going to deal with money. Um, it's going to lower your chances of winning, but if you're in a um, uh, a race where you you fig you know odds are ninety percent that you're not going to win anyway, uh, it's important to to run and at least force a discussion. And you know who cares if you win or lose? At least you have you have taken one for the team and you've promoted democracy. Um, if you are going to run a serious campaign, though, you do need a data wizard. And that is someone who can deal with the voter data, find out who you need to talk to, and who you need to visit, uh, who's going to vote for you. Uh, a data wizard should, would do things like, uh, in a primary, you don't want to spend time with people who have never voted. You know, if they're 65 years old and they never turned in a ballot, odds are less that they're going to vote than someone else who has voted consistently for the last 16 years. You want to spend your time with people who are going to turn in their ballot. Uh, you only have a finite amount of time to spend on your campaign and you need to use it wisely. And a data wizard will help you isolate the people you need to talk to. And then if you have tools like the van, they can print out lists sorted by the street address and maps showing you where the houses are uh, to walk. Um, if other other functionalities that you get with the van is that you get the minivan functionality, which is an application that sits on your phone, and uh, that allows you to enter data into the van um, uh, as you walk the neighborhood instead of the old-fashioned way of, of uh, filling out forms or making check marks and then taking it to someone who has to then enter the data later that day in, from someone's computer. Not only is it a waste of time, it gives, there's too much of a time lag. And if you're running a campaign in this, these days in a, this day and age, you need the data as quickly as you can get it. It's good to have a graphic designer and especially one who is good at word editing. Uh, candidates tend to want to share volumes of information about all of their positions. And really, you know, you can sum up a campaign in three to five bullet points and you need a graphic designer who can do that for you and then display it on a um, on at least a, hand, a walking piece for you that you would take take as you visit the neighborhoods. Uh, <clears throat> if you choose to go the, the, uh, the money route, uh, you need someone to help with fundraising and focus on that. Um, and then you need a volunteer coordinator because if you run a ground game where you're visiting uh, uh, many houses, you're going to need volunteers to help with that. And so you need someone to make sure that all the, the work is getting done and that the houses are visited. 
Any questions, at Betsy? Um, yeah, there's no question, but um, Charles Bynton said I um, I would like to run for office in St. Louis, and I'm a Justice Democrat. So I guess I had a question that this, what you're talking about, for the most part, would apply no matter what state you were in, right? Yes. Unless you have a state where the uh, the vote rigging is so uh, so rigged that it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> but yeah, these are these are um, uh, what I did as a pro one of the things I did when I was working as a professional was uh, I did process documentation and analysis. And so what I've done is I've broken a campaign down into the process steps um, that are repeatable and applicable to any size campaign. Uh, you know, I, I think it's more fun to run uh, local campaigns because th those are the uh, elections that have the greatest effect on you and where you live. But yeah, you can scale this to any size campaign, except maybe the presidential campaign, which is a whole different uh, ball of wax. Um, so uh, on the slide, phases of a campaign, uh, there's really four four buckets that um, the, um, uh, the campaign breaks down into. Um, the first bucket of activities is planning the campaign. So if you plan a campaign out uh, at the beginning and follow the plan and, you know, with minor adjustments as you go through it, uh, you have a better success of winning. Uh, once you plan a campaign, you need to identify the voters um, that you're going to target. Um, and once you've identified the voters, then you sell the candidate to those voters. Um, and then at the very end, you harvest the votes. Um, so uh this is much easier to do with smaller campaigns but it also scales to larger campaigns it just takes more volunteers to do but the idea is that you track voters individually and as individual human beings and not as as a uh, broad identity group that you're going to just bomb with uh with mailers and stuff um so this is why tools like the minivan are so helpful because if you know that there are uh, 10 people on a block that you need their vote for, you can visit them. You can note your visits in the van. You know that you have visited them and that you have uh, you've spoke with the voters and that they recognize your name. Uh, and then uh, when it comes to the end of the campaign, you can harvest the votes. So getting into more detail and the plan, planning the campaign, the first step, of course, is calculate the number of votes you need to win. Um, from that, you create the budget. Um, uh, and the budget tells you how much money you need to raise. Uh, you can create a fundraising plan. Uh, there's all kinds of books about how to do fundraising, so that in itself is not a, uh, a magic process. Um, you need to look at the time you have between where you are and uh, the election day. So you need to just map out all the activities you have and then stick to the plan. You need to ma map out your house parties and uh, uh, events, public events where you are, you're speaking and things to get your name out there and then uh, make sure that you execute. Um, and then the th last thing you need to do before you launch out is to craft your message. As I was saying, candidates like to talk about all of their positions. You really need to focus on the ones that are, that most resonate with your electorate. Um, here in Oregon, you know, the ones that are bubbling up right now are housing and healthcare and if you find out that find out these are the uh, issues that resonate most with your voters and that you have positions that resonate with the voters, then that's what you should be talking about. And that's what you should be putting on your material. And you should be talking about it consistently, not jumping all over the place. Um, once you have planned out the campaign, then you identify the voters. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this process on the next slide. But again, it's identifying the specific people that you think are most open to voting for you um, and treating them as individuals and if all possible get the candidate to go and talk with them uh, and that that's the selling of the candidate uh, you know listen to the voters make them feel comfortable with you make them feel like you're going to represent their interests when you uh, after you get elected and then the final step, which is harvesting the votes. So Oregon is one of the pioneers in uh, uh, vote by mail. We have uh, just under three weeks to get our ballots in. Um, and one of the things that that has allowed us to do is go into the, uh, the, 
the voter file and see who has voted. Um, and if someone has voted, you don't need to keep contacting them to get their vote in. You can take them off of your, your list of votes to harvest, and you can focus on the people who have not voted yet. Uh, and there's ways to do this that don't pe piss people off. Um, many people here are getting very tired about receiving phone calls. However, what we do is that we encourage um, our volunteers to call uh, people and first of all, uh, at the beginning of the voting cycle, check in and and see if they've they received their ballot. And if they haven't received their ballot, uh, encourage them to contact their elections office and and make sure either if the ballot is on its way that that they're going to get it, or if it's been sent and it's not been received, get a replacement ballot. Uh, people are very appreciative of those kinds of things because. Uh, uh, many people are surprised when the ballot shows up because they were not even aware that there's an election going on. So uh, that's the message that we give at the beginning of the voting cycle. Um, towards the end of the voting cycle, uh, like on the Friday before the Tuesday that the ballots are due, we call around and we make sure that uh, we do another public service message where we encourage people to not mail in their ballot because uh, you start running the risk of the ballots not getting delivered in time. And here in Oregon, if your ballot is not received by 8 p.m. on Election Day, then it does not get counted. So uh, uh, if it's the Friday before and they have not yet mailed their ballot, then you can say, well, where do you live? And we give people the list of all the ballot drop places and we encourage them to physically take it and cast cast the ballot so it gets in. Um, <clears throat> um, the uh, the reason why we give so many days is that for many people in rural parts of the state, they do not get next day delivery of, of mail. And it actually takes several days for it to get from uh, a rural location to the elections office. Um, and then uh, on certainly on election day, uh, early in the morning, see who has not voted the, there will be a lag in the updating of the data, so it's not going to be completely accurate, but at least it'll tell you to the best that we can determine who has not voted and start getting on the phone and seeing what can be done. Can we drive you to the ballot box to deliver it? Um, you know, how can you, you remind them that, yes, this is election day and it has to be in by eight o'clock and again, remind them where the ballot drop box is if they do not know. Because if they don't cast your vote, all of the work that you've done prior to that doesn't make any difference. So how do you identify voters? Um, so the way we run campaigns is all based on the premise of identifying the X number of voters that you have. Um, uh, so the f f one, er one easy marker is what political party do they belong to? So if you're a Democrat, there's an assumption you can make that they share Democratic Party values um, and that they, and if your opponent is a Republican, there is a, a, a inherent tendency for them to vote for you. So uh, you, can, you can mark them in your column. Um, for the other political parties, uh, some of the applications like the van have uh, markers that indicate their political where they are in the political spectrum. So if you're a progressive candidate and you have uh, a lot of non-affiliated non voters, uh, hopefully they have done a good job of tagging the non-affiliated voters with the, the uh, progressive scores and you can identify who they are. Um, and in the absence of data, if you have a gap to make up, um, uh, then you should just start walking and having conversations and assess where the voters are and their values. Um, uh, so you can either, in the, well, there's three states they could be. Either they're never going to vote for you because they are just so, totally opposed to everything you believe in. They are persuadable uh, and they're worth a visit back or they're in your camp and you can mark them as someone who you can rely upon, although never ignore. So if you go to the next slide, there's an example. So say you see you need 500 votes. So you go to the your database and you've, you've uh you, you found 250 people that uh, share your political party. Uh, you can reasonably assume that they're gonna vote for you if you're a good candidate. Um, uh, you go out and you do the, the search of the non-affiliated voters and you've picked, you can pick, find another 100 voters 
that is going to vote for you because they are on your side of the political spectrum. That leaves a gap of 150 voters to get to the 100 to the 500 voters that you need to win. And so uh, you need to go out and start visiting doors of people who are completely anonymous to you and find the 150 people who are going to vote for you that make up that deficit. And if you follow this process and you get these people to cast their ballots, then you will win. Assuming that your original assumption on how many votes it takes to win um, uh, is accurate. Uh, going to the next slide, how does a progressive run in a conservative district? Um, don't frame yourself as a liberal or a lefty. Uh, those are, are just not good labels to uh, run around with, even uh, even in, in more blue areas. I mean, what people really want are candidates in office who will represent them as people. And I think that was one of the major appeals that Bernie Sanders had as he ran across the United States. Because if you listen to him speak, he talked about things that relate to you as a human being. And it was almost uh, uh, party neutral because he was speaking about things that are important to people. And that's why you saw people on both sides of the political spectrum voting for him um, uh, in places where they could. Um, when you talk to people who are not necessarily aligned with you politically, uh, talk in terms of values and not issues. So don't go near the classic issues that, that uh, are always fought over. Boil them down into values that you share with the voters and have that conversation with them. Because if you share values with them, they're, they're going to be more likely to vote for you. Um, don't turn into a, um, uh, a cardboard candidate that just goes into autopilot and recite talking points. Um, it's hard to avoid, especially if you end up doing a lot of campaigning. But uh, always try to speak with a sincere voice and on issues that that matter to your voters and be be honest um, they might disagree with you but um but at the, at the very least they're going to respect you and i've heard many stories of people who vote for people that they don't agree with but because they at least know where you stand as opposed to someone who was evasive with their answers and you don't know where they're going to uh, to uh, uh, position themselves um, Betsy, any questions? Uh, no, there are no questions. We've stunned them all, and they answered everything. <laughs> you, it, it did. A, this is awesome. I mean, there's a lot it of is. comments that this is phenomenal information, and I, I like it. This is great. It's actually kind of encouraging, you know, when you're talking about these lower numbers or the smaller races, and and being able to calculate out what you really need to do to win. That's this is awesome. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, especially in races where you have very manageable numbers, like you need 600 votes to win, you can physically go out and talk to all 600 people who need to vote for you. Um, so that, that's why local elections are much more fun than the bigger ones. Well, and just one last thing to everybody out there who's wondering, I want to do something, but I don't know what. Larry just gave you a list of the, the, the principal jobs they're looking for. See how many of those you can fill. I mean, that's, you know, we, every, every independent candidate I know needs graphic help everyone <laughs> <laughs> including the ones that already have graphic designers sometimes yes. anyway so uh this was prepared by solidarity campaign management this is a campaign management company that i set up and the reason why i did that was not because i needed something else to do but we found that the alleged progressive campaign management uh companies here in oregon um uh, are controlled by the legislature and and we've actually had progressive candidates being denied their services because the the leg someone in the legislature said no don't represent that person um, so it it's one of the ugly sides of of politics here in oregon but uh we believe that uh, anyone who wants to run for office should have access to uh people who will help them strategize and win and that they shouldn't, uh, uh, they shouldn't be uh, uh, penalized because someone's not blessed their candidacy in the legislature. I mean, the, the, probably the reason why they're not blessed is because there's someone who's not going to be a good foot soldier and actually will re represent the needs of the people. Um, so if you want to see the website, it's scmpartnership.com.